Loveline is meant for an adult audience. Loveline may contain sexually oriented content. Discretion is advised. Adam Cool. Dr. Drew. I'm not modeling anymore for the two of you. Loveline. Yep. It is Loveline. I'm Adam Carroll. That is uh, Dr. Drew over there. Phone number 1-800-LOVE-191. Fax number 310-854-4455. Dr. Drew is a board-certified physician and addiction medicine specialist. And uh, Ann, is uh, Sophia Coppola coming in uh, tomorrow night, or is that uh, uh, up in the air? Yeah? There we go. There we go. All right. Dr. Drew's uh, mic is on, and uh, we'll find out about that uh, tomorrow or sometime tonight. But uh, let's get to the business at hand. Uh, Stone Temple Pilots are our guests tonight. Robert uh, DeLeo is in here. Scott Weiland will be in here in just uh, a few minutes. He's uh, attending the uh, Laker game, which should be wrapping up about now. So uh, Let's put out there, Lakers. You know, watch it. Yeah. It's good. Uh, I think they were up a point. Whatever. Good radio. Two points. Uh, it, yeah, and listen, I, I'm hoping they don't win just to make it an interesting series. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, my... Uh, my mom and grandma, you know, you never talk to women about basketball, older women, and right. they go, well, it's just not fair. They put a big fella right there <laughs> under the basket, they toss him the ball, and he drops it into the hoop. And you think to yourself, oh, Jesus, Grant, you don't understand. There's elbows flying, there's hips flying, there's other big guys Absolutely. muscling them out of position, there's three seconds in the key, there's the you know, picks and give and goes and all that kind of stuff. But now when I see Shaq... And I see the Lakers, and I see him playing a lot of their teams. I'm starting to hear my grandma's voice in my head. I put a big fella in there. They toss him the ball, and either they foul him or he makes the basket hoop. You know, they do, like, redundant toss, all drill. They make the touchdown score. So uh, I'm starting to think that way with the Lakers. And even though I was uh, born and bred in uh, Los Angeles and, and I'm a Lakers fan, I, I'd like to see an interesting uh, series. So I wouldn't mind if they uh, lost tonight. But let's talk about the uh, Stone Temple Pilots. Uh, the CD is uh, four. We're going to uh, hear something off of that. And um, where are you guys heading? And Because uh, I know you got a tour starting. I think it's uh, I think it's on my birthday, as a matter of fact. Oh. Is that May 27th in Boston? Actually, uh, we start uh, May 20th. Oh, that, wait a minute. It's not my birthday. This week. Well, uh, I haven't uh, been, I've been looking for a hot shaving dispenser for a, a week now. Yeah. It's not easy. Well, keep looking, buddy. And if the, the thing to, to release gel, forget it. Oh, really? You're not getting that. I one. can't fit my edge can there into no that such either. Thing. <laughs> All right. Well, enough about my birthday. The, uh, the tour starts uh, the 20th, and uh, I'm looking at the dates here. This is going to be... Uh, you're going to have your work cut out for you. Absolutely. It's about time. It's been a while. Are you looking forward to it? I'm looking forward to it. And Scott is in, uh, I wish he was here to tell you himself. Well, I'm he will really be. Very good health right now. That's good. Now, how long has he been out of the pokey? Oh, boy. Uh, I'm looking at my manager right now. Six months? Yeah, about five six months. Five, six months. Five, six months. And yeah. he, he was in for about five, six? Yeah, he was in there about five six. And I mean, uh, well, tell me what you think about it. I had a friend go into uh, going to prison for about five six months uh, for for drugs. And it, now looking back on it, it, was probably the best thing that happened to him. Yeah, it seems to be working. I, I think hopefully Scott didn't just get new ways to masturbate out of it. You know what I mean? Well, that think, could have been a plus as well. Well, yeah, but I mean, I I think keeping off drugs is is something that he needs. I told him the other day that when he is on drugs, he cannot handle it. He's a different person. Right. He's a different something. Right. And uh, he needs to he needs to the best he can to stay off of it. And going to jail for doing drugs is something I don't think he enjoys. I mean, getting to that point where he is literally going behind bars for drugs, I I, I think he he will agree that it's not you know, where he wants to be in his life. But well, we had uh, this discussion, I think it was uh, last week, when uh, Todd, who uh, who came in here, whose attorney came in here? Todd McCormick? Todd McCormick, the, uh, the uh, pot farmer with the uh, chronic cancer guy, came in here, Woody Harrelson, all those guys. Mm. And we were talking about drugs, and we all think they should be legalized for the most part. And I don't like to see people in prison for drugs, but uh, once in a while it saves someone's life. Sure. I mean, if they were just going to basically implode on the outside and there's uh, no force 
they can get them to stop yeah. than uh, when they're in there. Yeah, it sucks that the criminals that go to jail don't get reformed, you know. A lot of people go to jail for for far worse things and come out, you know, committing the same crimes. Right. And uh, that's a shame. Um, <laughs> as far as... Far shame as, that they're let out? What's that? A shame they're let out or a shame they're let out? No, it's better. a shame that they don't, you know, are re rehabilitated. Yeah, yeah it'd, be, uh, it'd be nice. I think some of them are. I think you don't tend to hear about them quite as much, but uh, you certainly hear about the uh, repeat offenders. Right. But uh, be that as it may, we won't uh, spin off that far in that direction. We want to talk about uh, the tour and the uh, album and uh, all that good stuff. And uh, we'll take some uh, phone calls. We'll hear some stuff uh, from Stone Temple Pilots. Hmm? Drew? They're watching that game like it's... Uh... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what, uh, is the game almost over, Ann? It's going to overtime. Oh, really? How much time? What's the score? Which the Lakers are up. The uh, Suns getting the ball back. They got one last chance. How much time? Two seconds. Three. Two seconds. Sorry. All right, we'll uh, hop we'll on the phone. Now. Joey. Joey. Yes. You're right. 22. What's up? Ah, uh, yeah. How are you guys doing? First time caller. Listen to the show all the time. I had to say that. Great. So what? Uh, no, I'm gonna get to the point. Um. When I get an erection, when I'm with my girlfriend and she turns around and I get an erection, um, after I leave, if, if we don't have any physical contact or anything, after I leave and I start to lose my erection, uh, it's like I have, like I either need to orgasm or I have to go to the bathroom. There's like, uh, it like leaks out, I guess you could say, a little bit, not a lot. Yeah. But but it's only after I have the erection and after after it's going down. It's not during. It's not before. It never happens any other time except for when my erection is going down. When it's going down. That's interesting. You, we don't get this. Uh, you know what I suspect? Much. I suspect it's in the plumbing. It's in the pipes. It's, it's just sort of. It's sort of. I do. I mean, I do have. I do have uh, a small bladder. I don't know if that is anything. No, it's not blood. urine. It's, it's semen. I'm sure of it because the pre-cum is very common. I suspect it's just sort of sitting. The pump is. The pipes are primed. And then when they sort of contract, something leaks out. Well, maybe it's just uh, gravity. Maybe when the penis yeah. starts heading down toward terra firma, the uh, semen just starts yeah. seeping out. Okay, because I do. Sure. I mean, this is another personal thing. Right. Right. Only six, only six minutes in the show, and you punch the mic. Usually, usually about the eight or ten minute mark. Well, I mean, it takes me, it takes me forever to, to finally reach orgasm. That's nice. Um, but just it, it, that there's a it, it's like pre pre ejaculation. That's what it is. There's a little bit. Is that is that can I, is there anything I can do for that? Or yes, there... put some tissue in your underpants before you go to your girlfriend's. No, it is normal and everyone gets it. Okay, because I mean, this is like it never really happens. All right. Ooh, this <laughs> guy's very concerned wow. about the three droplets of uh, clear fluid that come out of his penis after he's had a sustained erection. <laughs> he could wax on. He could do a good two-hour set on on just his penis and the fluid that drips out on the way home. Fisher? Yeah. You're 15. What's up? Yeah, um, uh, I was at a party last week, and I got pretty messed up, and uh, I blacked out and ended up waking up the next morning upstairs, which was two floors up from where I'd been. And then I went to school Monday, and my friend told me that I'd been uh, raped. Yeah. He's probably just screwing with you. I tell all my friends who get drunk and oh, pass out they were raped. This guy reminds me of the uh, bogus caller that was attacking you the other night. Yeah. But I was chatting with somebody at the ch in the chat rooms and came across a guy that knew the guy that called you. Ooh. And he said he's from Simi Valley. He's 26. Did that guy sound 26 to you? No, not uh, chronologically. Well, he's not like 17 at the most. Anyway. Anyway, this is another bogus call. Do you think so? Oh, yeah. All right, Fisher. Uh, well, let me, uh, I just want to say you are a genius, Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are a man god. I hope to be like you someday. Most uh, most gods are men, but thank you. Yes. All right. Good night. Thank you, there, Fisher. Good luck with the right. Okay. All right. Hey, uh, Scott, nice to meet you. So you'll never guess what happened. So I'm uh, I'm uh, walking over here, you know, and I get stuck in quicksand. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary throws a stick at me. And I think down there's nothing but my hat left. Were you, were you just a pit? Because you were struggling. You should have held still. No, I, we were at the, I 
heard that last night. You little quick sound thing. <laughs> you know, it was really weird. I, I walked into my uh, writer's room at the man show today and started yelling at them about quicksand and why we don't have more things written about quicksand. And uh, when you were talking about it just now, that's where I was remembering it from. So I thought to myself, uh, how the hell did you hear that? <laughs> then I forgot. Yeah, it's the radio. Yeah. Well, Scott, uh, I'm glad you're here. Lakers won, man. The last two seconds of the game, we won. We won. You were in the car oh, driving yeah. back. Yeah, oh. we the game. And, uh, oh. gosh, man, I hate when they throw those, those close ones like that. Show me, little mini strokes, you know? Yeah. They were uh, they were up pretty good in the third quarter, I think, and then they, they started coming down a little towards yeah, the end. Yeah, the foul, foul shooting just started, uh, you know, they started sort of missing those free throws. No, they sent the shank to the line. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what it is. Oh, I don't know what it is um, from a geometry standpoint uh, as far as why tall guys can't hit the free throws. You know what I mean? I mean, why would that? I mean, look at it this way. For some reason they can't like make watches. You know what I mean? <laughs> the, 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 the small muscle coordinating it there the same way. Yeah, you may you may have a point, or maybe they just don't have to buy watches. <laughs> they just kick the small guy's ass and take the watch. But right. a midget couldn't hit a free throw. You know what I mean? A midget wouldn't have an advantage over a guy who was five ten or six foot tall. So why does a guy who's seven foot have a disadvantage over a six foot guy? I don't, you know what? It's strange when you sit, when you watch him and you're right, you know, at that court level. He doesn't get any arc on it. No, he's, he's, he's well, it's well, just right. It's yeah. like half yeah. the time it hits the front of the rim and bounces yeah. off. Um, and it, I don't think it has to do only with the size because, like Luke Longley, who plays for Phoenix, is one inch taller than Shaq, and he's got a nice arc, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, well, white guys have to be able to make free throws, or they drum them out of the league. But it's just he's so dominating, though, that it, it, it's just incredible to watch someone that's huge, that quick and agile. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah he is an incredible athlete, and I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I watch the games, and he throws that big shack ass into people and starts backing them into the paint. And you either you you know what your defense is? You got to fall down on the ground and start biting his calf. <laughs> I mean, that that's like your only you thing that's going to keep him out. And then you get a a foul, and then he goes to the line, and then right. the game's over unless he misses, you know, ten out of thirteen or something. Yeah, I think he had like uh, almost forty points. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, he just uh, he just won his uh, MVP. MVP. Yeah. All right, so uh, Scott, thanks for. I, I we expected you in about an hour because we just saw the game end on the. I was putting, you know what? I was putting bets on ten thirty. I uh, I made a promise, you know. I uh, and these days I try to say what I mean and mean what I say. So. Well, that's refreshing. <laughs> How was the pokey? Oh, jail. Yeah. Um, I thought you were talking about that uh, Hawaiian uh, raw tuna dish. Um, uh, That's pokey pokey. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, jail, you know what? Um, it's not a great place to spend time. Um, I was very fortunate uh, that um, I have a good relationship with the people that run the Impact uh, Drug and Alcohol Program in Pasadena. And they have a rather, um, actually, it's a very experimental program within the L.A. County jail system that, uh, you know, was um, that that is sort of overseen by Sheriff Baca and the sheriffs. Um, and when you're allowed to go in into that program, do your do your time in there. Um, it's in really sort of a clinical setting. So you're you're working with counselors um, from seven in the morning to seven at night. Um, that's what you most of your day is spending group and uh, doing book study and that and uh, and you know working on uh, getting into the solution instead of just sitting around uh, commiserating about the problem. So I was really. Uh, fortunate to be able to, to that, I, that the judge gave me that opportunity. Now, mm-hmm. like, Robert Downey could have been given that opportunity to stay there because he was there at one time, but unfortunately, for whatever political reasons existed in, in uh, that, you know, particular courtroom, uh, you know, that he wasn't as lucky, but um, mm-hmm. I was. Yeah, so you're not you're not in with the uh, rapists and the arsonists and the murderers. Well, no, there there are people in there who, oh, who have, who have uh, you know, committed some pretty... Uh, Awful things in their in their time, but you know what? It's just to say it doesn't mean that one person is any worse than the other because any person who is a, in, is uh, you know severely addicted to drugs, um, I'm just fortunate. I make a lot of money. You know, I didn't have to go to those lengths that a lot of people have to go to to to, to stay well and to to not be sick. Um, there are people that are really good people that uh, in their disease are capable of doing just about anything at any given time, and uh, some of those people have 
to, to that level, and it's not. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad person. It means that they suffer from a really bad disease. Yeah. Well, what choice do you have? I mean, if you have no money and no means, and you're starting to uh, go through withdrawals, or you're starting to get the shakes, or you're starting to, I mean, you're you're in a lot of pain physically. It's it, it's more than just the I don't speak for you, but it's more than just the the pain. It's it's a some level a belief that you're going to be destroyed without the drug. Yeah, definitely. You literally it's a it's a survival Panic. instinct. Well, the point the is the point is you don't have any money. You you think you're going to die. You need the drugs, and you start doing things that you never would have dreamt of doing. Right. And uh, I I don't know what percentage of crime is based on that, but I would say a lot of it. Yeah, it is. It's like 80 to 90 in a lot of years. Well, think about what desperate acts so much of the crime is. I mean, think about something like carjacking. Right. Think about something like uh, just, uh, you know, running into a liquor store and jumping behind the counter or holding someone up at the ATM or or a... uh, Home invasion or something. I mean, those are those aren't guys that are cracking a safe or you know timing the Brinks truck. I mean, that's just desperate, desperate quick money, desperate yeah. quick things by desperate people, and and you don't get desperate that way unless you put the drugs behind it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Tony. Yeah. You're uh, 18. What's up? Hey. Okay. Ever since I've been to college, like I just started college, and I've been having like. Total promiscuous sex. I don't know what my problem is. Before that, I, before the past four months, I couldn't have. I had to be in a relationship with somebody, and now I'm here at college, and it's just like I've had sex with a lot of guys in the past couple months, and it's like nothing to me. I mean, either when I'm drunk or when I'm sober, and it's just so easy. And I before I'd have to be like emotionally involved with the person. How many, I don't how, understand it. How many are we talking about here? <laughs> it's just a number. It doesn't matter. But I don't understand why I'm doing it. Well, l- listen, Miss Coy. If it doesn't matter, then just throw it out there. Well, you, I can say for, for myself, um, I, I I went through a period of time when I was in high school and and my and the first couple of years in college when I was pretty promiscuous. And after like doing a lot of sort of thinking about you know, as I got older why it was, I kind of well, I definitely came to. Uh, figure out through inventory that uh, I was trying to overcompensate for um, feelings that I had kind of had um, for a lot of years um, as a person, um, feelings that I didn't really feel comfortable about inside, and so my actions were like an overcompensation to try to get rid of those negative feelings that I had inside. Hmm. You think you're doing that? Um, I don't know. I'm just like a guy without a penis. Like, I totally yeah, feel me like too. I don't know what my problem is. Well, I don't know. Well, I... listen, hey, Tony, tell us, tell us approximately so we can figure out what's going on. How many guys in in uh, that period of time? Okay, like in the last two months, it's been six guys. Oh my God! I know. And before that, I was like Mother Virgin Mary, Princess of. I know, but listen, six does not uh, make a slut anyway. Do you use protection? But in, yes, of course. But in two months. Yeah. That's a lot for me, especially since I was just like a little baby girl yesterday, now I'm in college, screwing all these guys. All right. Well, uh, why don't you slow down a little bit? My, I don't know. Well, you don't you, think you can do it? I think I'm a nympho- nymphomaniac. I mean, well, I totally love sex now. All right. Here, here's the deal. If you're sexual compulsive, uh-huh. usually the most common road to that behavior is sexual abuse in childhood. I never had any of it. Are you, is there addiction in your family, alcoholism? Um, my mother. All right. So maybe you're an alcoholic addict and maybe this is the way... Act alcoholics have uh, very responsive brains when they find ways to make themselves feel better. Mm-hmm. If they find the way of drugs, alcohol, sex, those things really do make you feel really good. And if you're carrying around a lot of negative feelings and you come upon one of these solutions, they become sort of compulsively entrenched. So you think I'm taking, like, negative feelings that I'm having that I really don't, subconscious feelings that well, I'm having? Well, not subconscious. You're, 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 not subconscious. You're just avoiding them. Maybe it's depression. I don't know what it is. You're just avoiding some feelings, and you're an addict, and you've found sex as a way of dealing with that. Maybe you should try practicing masturbation more often. Uh, there's not as much guilt associated well, with it. I live in the freaking dorms. I have a roommate. I mean, I would, I, you know, it's not that easy. Oh, well, listen, you, you women can do it very quietly. The only place we have to do it here is the showers, and it's just, it's just not fun. Do it at nighttime while your roommate's asleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, guys. All right. All right. She, 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 she's she's not in, well, she's not interested in change. Did no. you hear that? Sure. So, no, you change. know what's funny about being a woman is you have that awesome responsibility of having to sort of govern the amount of people you have sex with. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like working at a Baskin Robin. I know. <laughs> and the manager's out of town, and right. it's like you could just eat all day. Every flavor, every scoop, the waffle cone, the sugar cone, get out the whipped cream. You do whatever you want. You have to limit yourself. You have to go ahead. I believe that just an, an average-looking girl could go into just about any place and get laid four times more often than, like, the Best looking guy. Well, it's it's infinity it. versus a fixed number. Yeah. yeah. It, that's what it is. And, and listen, she could get one of the Sheen brothers if, if she wanted to. Uh, I mean, you know what I mean? They, they can get celebrities. <laughs> celebrities if they want. Oh, yeah. And like on a college campus, go, go to a couple of fraternity parties. I mean, you can do whatever you want. <sighs> Andy? Eyes are open. Yeah, that's me. What, what's up? You're 18. Uh, not much. First, I've got to give up the uh, obligatory shout to everybody. You guys all kick ass collectively. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, but the problem is uh, my girlfriend and I had sex uh, probably a week or two ago now, and um, everything was fine during, like for both of us, everything was all good. And uh, at the end of it, there was just a lot of blood, like everywhere, all over the sheets and everything like that. That's all right. Was, was there a period coming up? Definitely not. It, it mm -hmm. had ended like a week before. Well, it's not a common stimulated bleeding. It really isn't. It doesn't mean anything specific. Uh, I mean, everything's been fine since then, so we've yeah. been kind of... Uh, not been worried about it, but it was just, I mean, it was very, very odd at the time. She ought to have a routine. The fact that it was just after the conclusion of her period and the sheer volume is a little unusual, but just a routine kind of health screening is all she needs. Okay? All right. Um, can I just throw in, like, a kind of writer question on there? Yeah. Sure. Uh, totally unrelated, but um, I was wondering, like, kind of physiologically what the effects of uh, ecstasy are. Like, I was, I was thinking about trying it, and I'm very afraid of it. You know, the, well, the, main, the, main, the main problem with it is that even after modest exposure, and again, what that number is and how much that is, nobody knows at this point, there is overwhelming evidence of significant brain damage in the parts of the brain that are responsible for mood and memory. Uh, the National Institute of Drug and Alcohol Abuse are going to come out with a major campaign showing PET scans of brain and how, how the function has changed after exposure to ecstasy. Besides, sometimes really embarrassing things tend to happen, like you uh, sleepwalk, um, in the middle of the night, stand in the middle of your living room and uh, and uh, pull on your pants and urinate. Yeah, you did that. Yeah, I did that before. This just depends on what ecstasy you're you're getting too. M pure pure MDMA is what I'm talking. You about. did this stuff with PCP, and I don't think you'll ever do it again. Yeah, but pure MDMA is what does the damage. You and, know, uh, you know what's interesting about uh, guys. I don't think women do this, but when a guy gets really effed up, kind of blacks out, and does something in the middle of the night, it involves urine. <laughs> It always involves urine. Yeah, I've huh. had guys pee on their girlfriends, yeah. guys pee on their pets. Turntables. Yeah. Drew's, uh, yeah. Drew's roommate in college lifted the lid of the turntable and started urinating uh, all over uh, his uh, Molly Hatchet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you had. Uh, I think you had some, like, uh, sugar low for your Johnny right Mitchell. Or, uh, Joni Mitchell <laughs> on there. I mean, guys just start urinating places. That, that penis be, becomes, yeah. uh, it, it's worse than a car in the hands of a drunk driver. <laughs> it, it, it can kill people. Yeah. Uh, it's always uh, funny. I don't think women, I think never women, heard of that. Women right. get effed up and might wet the bed. Right, right. But if they did get up, they'd go to the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Guys get out of bed. It's always field day. Walk over to the Cuisinart <laughs> right. and start peeing on that. Yeah, it's a traveling show. Yeah, it, it, that's bizarre. It's like half on the bean bag half on the cat, the other half of the toaster <laughs> oven, then I'm getting back in the bed, I'm going to go to sleep. Would, it, would it be to... urinating or would it be marking? I, I, think, I think if, if you, you do it more I mean? in more than two places, it's considered it's, it's marking. Also, it's always very orderly. It's not that they're falling around or hostile. They're, they're going around and leaving a mark. It takes <laughs> some skill to urinate on a turntable, Drew, right? You have to, you have to lift that lid. You have to lift the lid, which I'm yeah. guessing he mistook for the uh, toilet lid. Yeah. Toilet seat. <laughs> You're lucky wow. you didn't have to go number two. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Stone Temple uh, Pilots are here. Number four is the uh, CD, and uh, we're going to be back and hear something off of that after this. Yeah, it is Loveline. I'm Adam Carroll. That is uh, Dr. Drew over there. Phone number 1-800-L-O-V-E-191. Hey, the man show is going to start in a few minutes, Kitty. Just going to give you a little uh, heads up there. Whatever. Scott, Scott mm -hmm. Weiland and Robert DeLeo are all here from uh, Stone Temple Pilots. Number four is the uh, name of the new uh, CD. We will uh, hear something off that. I think what they call them will uh, hear something off the CD. 
I was uh, I was driving home last night from the uh, radio station uh, here through about the 12 and change in the evening, and I uh, noticed a, a spider crawling along uh, my windshield right in front of me, right in front of my eyesight. Um, <clears throat> outside, because yeah. on the inside I wouldn't be here. I yeah. just turned into the bay, okay. and tried to drown the spider. <laughs> I've done that before, but. Uh, I noticed it, and I thought, well, oh, that's funny, because I'm driving, and my window's rolled up, and it's out there, and I'm doing about 35, and that uh, thing's going to go flying off any second now. Made it all the way home. <clears throat> now, I don't know where it came off, but I got onto the on-ramp, and I got onto the 10, and I got a, I got it wound up to about 85, and the thing was still <laughs> on there. It, it was just... It was yelling like mother effer and spider the whole time. But I couldn't figure out what was going on, but it was on a piece of glass... And it was it was toward the top, but it was right where I could see it, right in front of me. And I was literally over 80 miles an hour. Did not come off. And I thought I thought eventually it probably did come off. It was sort of crawling toward the uh, roof. But how does it do that? It was, it was on glass. I mean, it wasn't like it, you know it was a piece of leather or something yeah. or burlap or, or, leather. Leather or wood or anything. It was glass. And I was uh, over 80, and it was just hanging. I mean, it was wow. it was really hanging tough, but it was hanging. And I thought, I wish I could do that. Didn't Spider-Man climb buildings? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Kind of the same problem. Principle. Same, same oh. thing. He got the uh, high dose of gamma radiation, which, uh, as you know, either kills you or... It turns you into half a spider. <laughs> or you start growing. You get huge. Right. That's right. You get huge, yeah. too. All right, so uh, let's uh, talk to uh, Amber uh, over here. Were you talking to Amber? No, since it's okay. No, no. Yeah. Amber? Yeah. You're 19. What's up? Um, I've been with this guy for two years, over two years, and um, we were sexually active, but lately he wants to have anal sex a lot, and, you know, I don't mind I let him or whatever, but I want it in this one position that makes me have an orgasm really quick. What's that? It's like I'm on top of him, and I, like, put my arm around him and, like, pull him up towards me. And yeah, okay. yeah, she's on top, and then he, like, sits up, right? Yeah, kind of, yeah. but I'm, like, holding him up. Sure, that's our position. Oh, you're not, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, when we travel. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like... So you always turn away from me. Well, because I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of my love. <laughs> and the TV's on. All right, he, so, yeah. He doesn't want to do it, and I'm like, well, he let me do it, like... I, like, finally discovered this position, and I, like, love it so much. And then I, like, want to do it, and then all of a sudden he's like, I don't want to do that because it makes me feel like a bitch. I'm like, what are you talking about? He is a world-class dick. And, yeah, and then sure. so we got in this huge fight, and I'm like, I'm not having sex with you anymore. Now, this is very interesting because he, what he wants, then, is to put her in this totally demeaning, dependent yeah, position. Totally. Right. As opposed to sort of mutual position where she has some capacity to be present and in control, he can't tolerate that. Yeah. And it's past the sex at that point. Oh, it's more yeah, of a domination. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, he's, uh, any guy's like, um, if you're in an you know, intimate relationship, it, it's like you're in a pretty lucky situation if you ever get to uh, have, have it that way at once in your life. I mean, for him to sort of um, suggest that that's how he likes to have sex is definitely pretty strange and uh, the fact that you uh you um y you're aware of a way that 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 stimulates you and you're able to reach orgasm easiest i would think that he would be happy to uh you know please you in that way because what seems to make uh you know most guys um you know happy in the in the sexual way is when they know that they're you know, getting their 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 woman that they love off. I mean, yeah, that makes I, a man. I, I, don't, feel... I don't think it's sex at that point, though. I think it's a matter of maybe you should ask him what he really thinks of women. Yeah. As yeah. as a, as you as a as a woman, I think it's it's not even about the sex at that point. He, it sounds like he's making you out to be something that's maybe it's something that happened to him when he was younger or something. Yeah. Hey, Amber. Yeah. Yeah, we're just based on this information alone, we're uh, deeming this guy an a-hole and uh, telling you to possibly break up with him. We don't like him. As, uh, listen, that my theory, and I've told this uh, to Drew many times, the guys are obsessed with anal sex. They're not obsessed with the sensation of anal sex. They're obsessed with degrading women and the fact that the women don't want to do it. And they, a lot of guys just try to get women to do stuff they don't want to do. Absolutely. For me, it's everything. Well, and, and, I mean, the whole and, and it's interesting. He, the reason he doesn't want to engage in a, a situation where there's mutuality is he feels like a woman, right? Which is what could be worse than that. Oh. Yeah, what could be worse than that? So you have an orgasm in that position, right? Yeah. Oh, son of a bitch! 
anything. You know what? This guy doesn't know how good he has it because right. we we got to do the sex and, and then it's down in the basement for a half hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, most women get off uh, orally and they can enjoy the the intercourse, but eventually you want to finish the job, you got to get down there and get busy. And uh, geez, if you're getting off and you're just sitting on it, all the guy's got to do is sit up for three minutes. I mean, for what a bitch! Yeah, he's got it made. Yeah. All right, Amber, we don't like this guy. What do you do for a living? Um, he goes to college. He does what? He goes to college. Uh, college? Yeah. And w you're counting welding welding school as college? <laughs> or? This is real college. What do you mean college? Uh huh. He Jun plays basketball. He plays basketball at college. Junior college? No. All right. All right, Amber. Yeah. We don't like his style. Oh. And, and and any guy on the basketball team that's trying to put his uh, Pepe in my a hole is a, is uh, not a good guy. That guy's got to be hung. He's on the basketball team, right? New guy. There's someone out there that'll treat you better. He's not a point guard, is he? No. What what, what position? He's center. Center. Oh. <laughs> it's, I mean, he's got to be at least six eight, right? Yeah. Okay. Although we've met people who've been with centers. He's got a big right. Uh, right? <laughs> speaking of Shaq. Uh, <laughs> hey Amber. Yeah. Okay. Keep keep my wife. Thanks. All right, there. Uh, we were talking to, uh, who was that? Holly, Ro uh, Holly Robinson Pete. Was it, was it her? Yeah. She was, yeah. She uh, married uh, Rodney Pete, yeah, uh, yeah. I think. Uh, anyway, I was, I don't know what we were talking about. Jeez, I hope Shaq's still in the locker room. But uh, <laughs> he, uh, we're, we're on the uh, the yeah. TV show, and uh, I don't know what I was talking about. And I said, imagine this Shaq with his penis out chasing around the apartment. I mean, what a nightmare that would be for a young lady. And, you know, Holly is probably 5'4", and, and she leaned over during the commercial and said, uh, I used to date Shaq, and I went, oh, my condolences to your vagina. <laughs> and she said, uh, mm, no big deal. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, my God. And then a uh, big wow. high five by me and Jerome. I thought, yeah. <laughs> Yes. There's a guy. There's a guy. Right, right. <laughs> That's right. Thirty million a year. Can't, uh, can't, still can't do anything. All right. Well, uh, well, uh, uh we're gonna hear a song from uh, Stone Temple Pilots. What do you say? All right. You queued up there, uh, Anderson? Yes. This is Sour Girl. <laughs> Good radio. <laughs> <laughs> Phone number. He's rubbing off on you. One eight hundred L V E one nine one. Forget about the fax number. Uh, that is back through. Uh, I'm Adam Carolla. Mm -hmm. Scott and Robert are both here from uh, Stone Temple Pilots. Four is the name of the CD. Uh, we got some. Uh, the the tour starts on the twentieth uh, of uh, May, and uh, I have some uh, concert dates. I can give uh, some of you out there a, a heads up when they're coming to a city near you, but I want to uh, just check these uh, off with uh, producer Ann and uh, make sure I'm giving the right uh, cities the right heads up, all right? So uh, we'll get into that, and uh, I'll give you guys a heads up next break. Sean? Sean? Caller who goes by Sean. Who is 25 years of age. And sleeping. Oh, really? Yeah, it's no fun unless they're snoring, though. All right, we'll put Sean uh, back on hold and speak to uh, Janice. Oops. Oops. How did I do that? Jenna? Hello? You're 20. What's up? Um, I've had sex 528 times in the past 19 months, and I was... Oh, my... <laughs> well, wait a minute. Same person? Yeah. Um, with my boyfriend, fiance, we're getting married in August. Did you have some kind of little, uh, hat sheet or something? <laughs> like <that>? <laughs> <laughs> device? Yeah, it's like on your, on your fighter plane. You okay. mark them off every time you have a kill. <laughs> it's with the yeah, swastikas stickers on the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> Football from a helmet. Yeah, yeah. Hold on a second. I got something to say about that. Uh, I was talking about quicksand last night. What happened to quicksand? Scott was uh, nice enough to bring up. But what happened to sticking stickers on the things and putting notches and things yeah. to signify things? Yeah. Like right. uh, gunslingers from the old west would put a notch on their holster yeah. and handle their gun. Prison would be knocking off the day. Yeah, they do that. Scratch it into yeah. the side of the wall and then do the X thing for the five days. Fighter pilots would have the, you know, Japanese uh, rising sun flag or the swastika, whatever it was. Football players, it was very popular, especially in college and in high school. They'd put the sticker, the skull and crossbones or whatever, all over the side of the helmet. I think uh, Michigan Wolverine. Ohio State. Ohio, Ohio State, State. Ohio State, State still does it, but I think they're like the only major team that still does that. Yeah. Uh, 
Anderson said that Willie Stargell, I think, used to do that. I think the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates used to have something. It, there was this very hot trend, notches in the bed post yeah. for every time you got laid. People don't keep tallies anymore, not in the form of stickers and notches. I'd like to see some of that coming back. <laughs> Drew? I would like that, too. Yeah. Not only that. But, Jenna? Yeah? 528 uh, in what period of time? 19 months. So what's 19 times 30? So it's about, about 600 and, and a half. About once a day, right? Roughly. Yeah. That's pretty good. Right. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the, what is the, I'm not sure I understand the question. And how do you, how do you tally it? Um, like penetrative sex, like just you write it down. Um, I also write down like if it's anywhere interesting. Right. I, under, I understand. Do you have a diary or something? Um, yeah. Well, it, it used to be. Now it looks like a phone book. <laughs> Hey, but you, you know what's you know what's lovely about women, uh, guys. Hold on one second, because I just need an amen here. Uh, Jenna's twenty. Jenna, you know, gets up to thirteen hundred times in uh, as many days with a guy. Chronicles each one of them in uh, painstaking detail. Uh, they get engaged, but he ends up banging her best friend six months later. They break up. Somewhere down the line, you enter Jenna's life. Now you're dating Jenna. You're getting pretty serious. <laughs> It was that time of your life. You're starting to think about settling down, and uh, Jenna goes away to uh, Vegas for a weekend with four of her <laughs> friends who are from Michigan, where they grew up, and uh, they're having girls' night. And you're uh, you're alone in the place, and uh, one night you're looking for uh, you're looking for scissors, and out slides this uh, this uh, lovely book. It's this bound in leather, and you uh, open it up, and uh, the first page, uh, number one. <clears throat> He banged me uh, against the crapper in the downstairs crapper. Uh huh. Turn the page. Uh, by the time you get to you know 1427, uh, we screwed on the uh, space shuttle. <laughs> I mean, women love to chronicle this stuff. What they don't realize is they then take all of this documentation into their next relationship gather some more documents, move into a next one. I mean, she's 20. By the time she, you know, settles in at 27 with some guy, this guy has, a, you know, a dossier of her weeping. sexual encounters. It's, you know, it's, it's like the, the president, it's like the Watergate hearings. You know? it, it, it does point out the difference between how many women perceive that. And for women, it's like, that's, those are episodes of romance, of connectedness. For, for men, it's like, yeah, it's sex, Jack. No, but look, the next son of a bitch who has to get hold of that diary, though. All right, Jenna. You want something even more entertaining? Uh -oh. Writing it down was his idea. Oh, no. no. You're, not, you're not marrying him. Yeah. Oh, yes, I am. All right, you better. That's it. And, and the day you guys divorce is the day you burn that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's something diabolical in this. Yeah. He but, writes it. No, he, 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 she has this dossier. Got, and make sure guys come across it. They're going to be like, oh, no. No, I can't. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. You've got to make you wear it around your neck. <laughs> All right, Jenna, so you never stopped having sex. No. Day number 45, he pulls out to get drink of water, and it's back in five minutes. All right, so uh, what's up? Um, just wondering what the medical classification for a nymphomaniac was and how close I am to that. Well, it's usually, it has nothing really to do with the frequency so much as the consequences of the okay. behavior. In other words, if you're doing it in situations that are dangerous or potentially harmful, you know, and, that, and or if there's progressivity, worsening of the, the intensity of the risk and the, and the kinds of things that are happening as a result of the behavior, you're losing money. What's up with job. this guy wanting it documented, though? That's strange. Um, probably tiny little bit of obsessive compulsive. Yeah. He's pretty much a perfectionist. <laughs> Accountant or something? Um, creative writing major. Mm, right. Poet, writer. Yeah. All right. So uh, now does he ever criticize you uh, for not riding with enough flair? Um, actually, no. I was in debate in high school, and I can write just as well as he does. Fantastic. So what you guys are doing is performance art. Yeah, you could call it that. All right, Jenna. All right, thanks. All right, don't have any kids for a little while. You're both going to screw them up, okay? Please. Yeah, we would. Talk right. to you later. Yeah. He's still sane, but... You know, Barely. Sort of, he's, yeah. He's grading her paper. I think is what is happening there. Yeah, that is not the plan. The, the, the objective is to try to stick the paper together, not uh, not grade it. Matthew. Matthew, yeah. what's hey. up? How you doing? Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, well, my question is, uh, I smoke uh, weed every day. No kidding. 
Hold on, let me scrape through up wow. off the carpet. He is flabbergasted. Okay, okay. In all his years of training, he, he never has been fooled this way. All right, Matthew. Yeah, but I was wondering what is the, the effects of it? Have chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis is a routine complication of marijuana use. That, that's, yeah. that's pretty much everybody gets that. Baffled, aren't you? Yeah, that's shocking. Everybody gets it. If you smoke a lot of pot, everybody, it, it's just one. Of the, it, it just sort of absolutely does that. It's a routine. Oh, yeah. But uh, whether or not it causes emphysema is debate. Whether or not it causes lung cancer or heart disease, probably not. There's some concern about lung cancer. Uh, and then the overwhelming concern, obviously, is what it does to your brain. It makes yeah. you pretty damn mellow, too, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Hey, but, man, you, you can t I, I, one positive thing is I, I hear that you can tend to get really good at uh, video games. Oh, uh, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, because you, you get locked in. You I'm are the video right. game. That's why. <laughs> You're in it. You don't have distractions like peripheral vision. Really good like at remembering that. the Domino's pizza delivery number and stuff like that. <laughs> All right. Hey, Matthew. Yeah. I, I know I know. pot seems pretty harmless and pretty benign at this uh, stage in your life, but it can ruin you, and it can screw you up. Yeah, I was and wondering. It, um, you may be a good candidate for that. It your brain, too. Trust it? It's, yes. yes, it does, in fact. There's, there's uh, good evidence, particularly the parts of the brain that, in your age group, the right frontal lobe seems to be affected most, which is the one you're supposed to be using as you go through school. But here's the, here's the good news. You, your brain shrinks, but your uh, breasts grow, so it does kind of even out. <laughs> That's, that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a bad hand. I mean, uh, so how old is he now? It's kind of one of those little squeezy hey, devices with the guys that be squeezing their eyeballs. Yeah, right. yeah squeeze the head. Boobs come out. Yeah, and the nuts uh, suck up. Yeah. So in 10 years, we'll be wearing a man's yeah, ear. They do. Sure, you ought to come up with a uh, little uh, yes. squeezy stoner doll. Yeah, uh, really. Adam, try to message home. This is the best idea you've ever had. This is it. It was yours, buddy. All right, we're going to take a little break. Stone Temple Pilots are here, and we'll be back after this. Line. I'm Adam Carroll. That is it. Dr. Drew. Better. Just, just, just talking about it. Yeah. Scott Weiland is here. Robert DeLeo. Uh, I also. hate you. I hate your pregnancy. <laughs> you did this to her. Stone Temple. Huh? Again. Pilots are the uh, name of the band. Uh, number four is the name of the uh, CD. Drew just left the door and Robert, Sorry. but uh, that's all right. He's uh, in and uh, getting seated, and we'll uh, start the uh, second hour of the uh, fabulous program. We're going to hear something from uh, number four, Stone Temple Pilots uh, CD, uh, coming up real shortly. And, uh, oh, man, i got a lot of concert dates. <laughs> we'll put it this way. If you, if you live in the United States, they're coming. They're coming to uh, your town or neighboring town uh, in the next few months. And uh, out with the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, who, uh, well, let's see. I don't know if I've met everyone from uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Seem, uh, there's a band that's uh, had a few ups and a few downs in there. And Fishbone, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah, I think Fishbone is actually... We're doing the first leg. We're doing two yeah. legs with the Peppers, and then uh, uh, on the first leg, the, the Fishbone are opening the show. Yeah, Fishbone's a real fun, good band that's uh, been around for maybe as long as the Peppers? Yeah, they have both. Uh, they have I think longer. Both, maybe both, longer? Both groups pretty much started, I think, in the early 80s. Uh, I believe the Chili Peppers' first record came out in yeah. 1983 or 81. I think it was 81. Yeah, the first one came out in 81, the second one came out in 83. And uh, Fishbone has been sort of, uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to put this without sounding like a slight against the band, but they, they've pretty much just been doing their thing. Never really peaked, never really uh, bottomed, uh, always had a strong fan base. People uh, know music, know who they are, but never really... There's, there's, just from, meeting, just from meeting those guys, there's serious, serious musical integrity. Yeah. Uh, on all their, you know, on everyone's behalf. You know, and Angela writes a lot of poetry, too. Yeah. yeah, he does. And I think, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the problem, and uh, it's a similar problem that's existed within rock and roll since the beginning of rock and roll, is that, uh, these are guys who play, you know, they're, they're known for, like, their ska show. And I think that it's a lot easier for record corporations to sell a ska band where they're filled with good-looking white guys in right. suits. Interesting. And, uh, and, you know, you have guys that are not white guys, and uh, they have been doing that form of music, uh, this new ska. Uh, they're the purveyors and the pioneers of that. And, uh, 
And because uh, they're not white, the record companies don't have a harder time selling that. Well, you know what? You know, yeah. it's the same thing with the Elvis story, you know? You know Angelo, uh, Angelo is, uh, they're so real, it's harsh. Yeah. And so it doesn't have that sort of mainstream appeal. Yeah, they're conversational. He, he, read, he, read a, he, he did a webcast with me at com, and we have a, a, a speaker to the, to the street. People gather out and watch his webcast we do. And he read a poem, and it was amazing. But it was so harsh, we got in trouble with the passing police department. Really? It was like, wow. it was, <laughs> and, it was, and it was, you know, and it was, I mean, it was great, artistic, wonderful poem, mm. but it was harsh. You know, it's amazing yeah. to me, though. How do you keep up that level of intensity for 20 years? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I understand when you're 19 and you're angry at the world and you got testosterone coursing through your veins, but I mean, I, I can tell you personally the difference between 35 and uh, 19 is. Uh, <laughs> I go home and wait to die every night. I hope to die. I sleep my fingers crossed. I have to wake up dead, so I don't have to go leave the house the next day. And I don't know. I could not get up on stage, do the tour. You know, have that kind of that kind of fire in my belly that these guys uh, have each and every night. But the point is, is if you go out and uh, see them in concert, you'll be uh, the recipient of that uh, that unextinguishable fire that uh, burns and. Deep in the heart of the belly of uh, Fishbone and uh, Stone Temple Pilots and uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. There, it's a smooth transition. Matt? Hey. Hey, 22. A, what's up? Hey, I'm a huge SCP fan. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Scott, I love you. You're the greatest. I already got my tickets for your sack show. My, my sex show? Your Sacramento show. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, tickets for my sex show haven't gone on sale yet. Damn. Um, You're my, gay. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite song is that Adhesive off Tiny Music, and I was just going to see if you can tell me a little bit, bit about the history of that. And do you guys do that live, or? You know what? Um, that's that song is uh, is probably one of our favorite songs too. Um, definitely off of Tiny Music, and the odd thing is that that's probably the only song uh, that we have never fully performed live. Um, um, that was kind of tough to it, it tackle. Is, yeah, live. It, it was kind of a uh, you know a, a song that we just approached in the studio, with, um, and uh, I don't know I don't know really how we would pull that off. But then again, we thought that of uh, of uh, um, help me out with this one. The one we just recently uh, started doing um, uh, uh, kitchenware and, kitchen and candy bars, but we found a way to do that live. Um, lyrically, the song is um, sort of about a. Uh, you know, my life at the time, um, I was really struggling very hard with uh, drug addiction, and uh, and we were being pushed very hard to, um, you know, to do a lot of work and to do a lot of touring, and at at, at that time, I sort of felt like, uh, um, well, there's a line that sort of sums it up. It says, um, um, sell more records if I'm dead, purple flowers once again, hope it's sooner, hope it's near corporate records fiscal year. Um, that's kind of I don't know in a nutshell how how the, what those words sort of were um, to me. Hey Matt. Yeah. When uh, they get to Sacramento, which uh, by the way is going to be on the uh, 9th of uh, September, I believe. September. Well, they'll be there June 10th. Oh, June 10th. What I do? I missed uh, missed that one. Well, the point is, is when they do come there. Yep. They're not going to play that song. <laughs> All right. Okay. I love the rest of them too. So it's good. Fun. They'll play those. Asshole. Okay. <laughs> Katie? Yes. What's up? Hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I love the show. And, Adam, you kind of um, come across, you know, sometimes as being crass or whatever. No. But I know that they're devoid, but you're not fully me. I know that I think you're just really sensitive and you give great advice to people. Thank you. Man, you Thank you. Really, uh, Thank you. the wool over this young lady's eyes. <laughs> but, anyways, um, my question is, I was curious if it's possible for a condom to leak, even if it doesn't break to yes, the bottom. Absolutely. Probably oh, leak to the base, like where, where yeah. it sort of. Yeah, that is one of the areas of concern. If it slips or if it. You mean down, deep it around the, uh, the base, right, yeah. where it's supposed to. Yeah, that's why you got to roll it all the way down. That's a bad sign. And they can happens. leak out the tip without having a uh, actual break too. That's another way they fail. Or if you have a member the size of uh, Roberts, then they just tend to bust on you. Yeah, no, it didn't break, but I just, I had sex with my boyfriend today, and it just kind of felt, um, after I had orgasm, like it leaked at the bottom. Yeah, I can. And I wasn't sure if I should be concerned about, because I, I believe it's kind of around when I'm ovulating off. That's you ought to take that morning after pill if you have any concern at all. Okay. Really. Uh, what, but how often does one, would one leak 
I mean, without breaking. I don't you know. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it just it doesn't sound that likely. You know what? It's not that likely, but she has a concern about it. Watch her hell. I don't want to be the person. Take that morning after so yeah. Why not? You know, I um when I was in the, the L.A. County Jail, um, and the, the, the drug program, every every month they, you had an, an AIDS class, you know, and um, and uh, they gave us this um, sheet of paper at the end of the class, and it, and it had all the the, con the main condom brands, um, and then and then it broke them down into their their uh, percentage of effectiveness, and uh, um, it's pretty amazing that some of the main brands are only like around fit, fit, like 55, 60 to 70 percent effective. Right. Even like Trojan, the ones that were up in the 90 were, um, I can't remember the name of the one. Um, but it used to be Ramsey. Like, no, yeah, I think it was. Correct. Right here? Correct. I think uh, those ones were a couple of them. But there was a lot of the ones that people use all the time, they were, the, the percentage wasn't really all that effective. Wouldn't that uh, be the thrust of your advertising campaign if you really? were yeah. amongst the higher ones up there? I mean, they're always doing these things where uh, you know if I've done a survey yeah I mean if you if I got a condom company and I'm the in the 90 percent uh, effectiveness uh, percentile and uh, that my competitors are down in the 60s that's the first thing I'm bringing up I mean that is the paramount issue I never see them uh, they never seem to bring that up they never slam the other ones you know mm -hmm. how like Pepsi always slams Coke or Coke will slam Pepsi, you know, when they're doing advertising. You never hear Ramsey slamming Trojan or, or Trojan uh, slamming uh, Chic or... You know, I think it's like not is. the effectiveness that sells condoms, it's the sensitivity. I guess yeah. that's... Uh, I guess you know why I don't think it's a problem? I think each of these companies makes so many different brands, they probably also have some of the lesser effective ones. Uh, 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 yeah. You buy Westwood One and Trojan, America's number one condom, trusted for over 80 years. That's right, but not the same condom. you got to get a new one every uh, 65 years, right? <laughs> Is that true, Drew? Emil? 48. Emil? Emil. E e okay, Email? just listen. Listen, Emil. If someone calls you a meal, answer, right? Yeah. All right. What's up? Oh, it's, I got a problem with violence, uh, especially towards my girlfriend. Jesus. Girl, a mental note. Uh, don't make fun of uh, guys' names that have problems with violence. There's a voice that sounds like Paul Bunyan in James Earl Jones. Sorry. Right. That's all right. Now, don't ever apologize. That's fine. Everything you do is golden around here. Well, what are you doing? Well... I mean, I lose my temper a lot. I mean, I don't mean to. I mean, I do. I feel bad about it. And what do, what do you do? What's the worst you've done? I broke someone's neck once. My God. That's, like a... That's not so bad. Or... Yeah, I'm sure they had it coming. Was this a girlfriend or just some guy? Oh, this is someone I was locked up with. Okay. But, for, for, uh, watch the door. Would you? <laughs> and uh, what were you locked up for? Um, salt. I see. Salt. All right, so you you have a history of violence, then, right? Yes. Okay, and you'd like to stop that? Yeah. And, and, and uh, someone was violent with you when you were growing up? Sure. Yeah, a little bit. We all have a little violence, you know. No, not everyone does. And uh, it's what causes kids to... It's like taking a puppy and beating the crap out of it. Are you surprised that dog wants to bite everybody that comes around? No, of course not. No, somehow we, we miss that in humans. I don't know. Right. All right, so uh, you, you've been you've been incarcerated. You're out now, but you still have some of the same tendencies. Have you been on medication? Uh, no. Has anybody ever suggested that to you? They suggested it for my for my parole. But uh, my whole thing is about my girlfriend. I mean, I just one of these days I'm going to hurt her, and I really go into it, and I really love her. All right. Well, what? the whole thing's not about your girlfriend. The whole thing's really about you. And um, you know what? I just I can say this. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a problem with drugs and alcohol, um, and, uh, you know, I've also been incarcerated, too. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know what, if, you, if the problem's not with, like, your girlfriend or your brother or your best friend, uh, the problem really is kind of like, 
if you don't want to, if you want to stop acting that way and you feel really bad about it and it's affecting the relationships in your life, you really need to do kind of what Drew said and go talk to um, a professional, man, because it's uh, it's something that a lot of people suffer from and there are people that can help you with that problem and it will improve the quality of your life. And a part of it might be that you might need to take some kind of medication to take the edge off your uh, temper. Take the edge off or to help contain in those situations where it seems to get out of control. It's a biological process, and there are things that can just sort of keep a lid on it for you. Isn't Tegretol drug people use for that? Anti-epileptic medication how, your rel- could, could be something. How's your relationship with your mom? My mom is dead. When did she die? How old were you? Oh, she died about eight years ago. Hmm. Was she an addict? Excuse me? Was she an addict, alcoholic? An alcoholic, she died. She fell on the steps and broke her neck in four places. Do you do you look at your girlfriend like uh, it might be a memory of your mom? Did you have a bad relationship with your mom? Well, you may have struck a nerve there. Hey, uh, I don't want to mispronounce his name again. What's his name? I'll tell you, the neck breaking seems to be a uh, a theme that uh, follows him around. He's <laughs> not the kind of guy you want to go camping with. Like, oh, last four people I went camping with. <clears throat> they went home with body bags. Uh, don't ever make that sound, man. It's yeah. it me. It hurts. An awful sound. Yeah, it hurts my feelings, that <laughs> sound. It just, it just hurts. It's riding on a fork, isn't it? Yeah, it's just something. It's, I've been a big ball of foil or something. All right, listen. All of you who are angry and are uh, prone to violence and aren't uh, currently committing an act of violence and uh, are calm and are aware you have a problem, now is the time to deal with it. Not when you're getting violent because you'll see red and you'll uh, you'll wake up in prison for uh, for a hundred years. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody, you, you really uh, listen. <clears throat> and here's here's a good point. Um, if you're a violent person and, and you're prone to violence and you have a history of violence, and you're having a calm moment and you're aware of your problem, think about your next potential victim for just a second. Think about the guy who cuts you off on the freeway, you take a tire iron to his head, think about your next girlfriend, think about your kid, think about your uh, brother or sister, whoever it is. Whoever it is, you smack next or you injure or shoot or stab next. Think about that potential person and get some help now and think about yourself. Because who, you know, why the hell do you want to go to prison for doing something that you didn't even want to do? Mm. I mean, a week later or an, or, or an hour later. Tricia? Yes. You're 25. Correct. What's up? Um, I had a comment for SPP, and I bought, I had to say that, the, I'm really nervous too, <laughs> the solo album of his, I wanted to know if he's going to perform any of the songs in the solo album he did on a tour. Scott? Um, no, those songs were, um, were you know, very important, you know, very, very important to me, but that was, uh, it's a whole different thing, just like, uh, you know, the record that those guys made, uh, the talk show record, is uh, those songs are important to them, but that's not STP. So, um, no, we won't be doing that. And it's not to say that we don't love those songs that we did on those two respective records because they're, you know, they chronicle times in our in our own lives. But, uh, you know, the four of us make STP, and yeah. uh, the songs that we will perform are the songs that the four of us uh, have recorded together as a group. Well, it's a great album. Thank you very I much. Five, I, I got so many people, my friends of mine, just to buy it because it's a wonderful album. And I'm a big, big fan. I'm so excited. I'm nervous to talk to you tonight. <laughs> and I also have a, a comment. Adam mentioned earlier how when some guys get intoxicated, they mark their territory <laughs> by urinating, like, on the on anything available. Mm-hmm. When I was about 19 years old, I went to a party. Yeah. And I woke about 2 or 3 in the morning and wandered out to the left because at my home... That's where the bathroom was at. Well, at this apartment, that's where the outdoor patio was at. And I went outside and pulled my pants down and urinated on the lawn furniture. Oh, that's refreshing to hear me doing that. Yeah, and I woke up the next morning. Where'd you go to finishing school again? On that? I'm working on that. I see. I went to, um, and the next morning, we went outside to smoke, and the girl walks in, one of the girls at the party, and she says, Did it rain last night? Yikes. And uh, if if it did rain, we're moving because uh, that smells like urine. When did you re- when did you realize it was what you had done? We're going to Canada. I pretty much realized it as soon as I finished doing it. Uh, but I didn't really care too much about it at that point. I was probably pretty. You, you have the uh, soul of a man, Tricia. I can, I can hear that. 
and a, and a I am mad a scientist man. last. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm a woman, but I'm a huge fan of that show. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, God bless you. I record it for my friends who don't have cable. They all this is the woman that's a fan of the man show. Wow. Yeah. She gets loaded and pees on things. You're yeah. in some lawn furniture. Yeah. All right, yeah. Tricia. I'm quite the catch, I bet. Yo, know, in many ways, I'm sure. I just want to say I love you. Especially your if you're another woman. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> Who likes women? Can yeah. I say real quick hi to the Glendale Rec in Phoenix, there, or in Glendale, Arizona? No. We listen to you every night. Everyone that listens to you guys, and we all just love it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, guys. Again. Thank you. Okay. All right. Hey, uh, hey uh, Anderson, yeah, what is uh, Jesse Ventura and who uh, brought that up uh, earlier? Let's see what uh, he had to say about the man show. on television, the man no. show. Oh, the best. <laughs> If you can yeah. take it, what, what, what is it? What is it? The man show. Oh, that's what I love about that uh, Jesse Ventura. I'm going to Minnesota and voting for him uh, next election. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, should we hear something uh, from Stone Temple sure. Pilots? Let's do it. Let's do it. Off of uh, number four, the uh, CD currently out. This one is called Down. <laughs> Yep, you get a whole team. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's true. Why don't you go yourself and have fun? No, the <laughs> boys are just bugging me. They've done What kind of dad are you? I can't use oh, uh, let me. I'll introduce him to my dad. Don't worry. <laughs> They'll understand what kind of dad you are. Please. Oh, it, is, uh, it is uh, Love Line. Uh, Scott and Robert are both here from the Stone Temple Pilots. Number four is the name of the uh, CD and uh, phone number one eight hundred L V E one nine one. And uh, what did Ann say about the Sofia Coppola uh, tomorrow night? Oh, she did that. Uh, what else say? She did that. Thumbs down. up in there. Oh, thumbs up. Oh, I see. She's coming. No, no. I know. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> I want to go to track with you one day yeah. and uh, see what horse you bet on, so I can yeah. uh, bet on uh, any other horse but that horse. That's good. <laughs> Remember, I'd like you to bet on uh, seven or eight horses so we could just narrow it down to two or three for me to bet on. <laughs> Did you do that? Yeah. Okay, because you're always 100% wrong. Lee? Yeah. You're 25. Yeah. What's that? Hi, I wanted to say hi to uh, STP there. Hey, man, how are you? I wish I could uh, discuss guitar with Robert all night long, but since this is Love Line, I'd better get to my uh, drug question. <laughs> I wanted to ask Scott, you know, I've been to rehab three times, and... Uh, I can't seem to get with the program, and uh, basically my problem is I'm not a people person, and I really don't give an ass about anybody but myself. And I, I figured I'd ask Scott if he can give me some pointers, because if anybody doesn't give an ass either, it's probably Scott. Um, well, I don't know. I, I can just tell you from my experience. Um, uh, you're having a hard time getting clean. You go into rehab and you're having a hard time well, getting clean. From what I understand, you got to be willing to be a people person. No, not at all, actually. Because you don't have to, like, not really at all. The only thing that you have to do is sort of just become open-minded and and willing to take some suggestions. It doesn't have to be from a crowd of people. It just has to be from maybe one, maybe a couple people who you relate to. That's why they suggest going to meetings and not just forming an opinion based on what your first meeting, your first few meetings going, uh, you know, a few, trying a few different ones until you meet some people that are kind of like yourself. And if your life gets bad enough, trust me, if, if you start doing some, some jail terms and you start losing, uh, you know, important relationships, having failed marriages, then you might start to be a little bit more open-minded about, you know, maybe kind of listening to some of the stories that these people have. Um, for me, you know, I wasn't able to, um, you know, uh, get clean and stay clean. And, you know, it's still, I don't even have a year yet. I've got over 10 months now. Um, but the reason why is because I want to be clean now. You know, I've had every every reason you know, pointed the, out the, the fact that I needed to be clean. I mean, that evidence was there that I needed to be, but I really wasn't willing to. I really didn't want to. My life hadn't gotten to the point where I, uh, you know, accumulated enough negative consequences where I really could not stand living that way any longer. Um, and, you know, once your life starts... to deal because I see it coming, you know. I see myself losing my job. What's your drug? What's your choice? Oh, I, I, I stick with weed mostly, but if I did anything harder, I'd probably be dead by now. But, you know, I get around to whatever is available, but weed's my drug of choice. 
I mean, that's the daily deal. All right, but so you're not at the point where you're you you haven't bottomed out yet. Right, yeah, and I I see it coming, but I just don't want to get there. It's really interesting that you bring up um, an issue that I've struggled with with people for a long time, which uh, I think you can summarize by asking the question: How do you give somebody get it? How do you get somebody to get it? That they need to get it. That they need to get with it. That they need to follow directions. How do you give somebody that? Yeah, and so far, good. there's no one that's able to give somebody that. Okay, well, you know, I, I kind of I pretty much knew the answer before I called. I just want to say hi to Scott and Robert. Really. And by the way, I don't believe you're not a people person. You may not like groups of people. You may not like a lot of different kinds of people. But uh, the connection you can form with somebody yeah. will be important to you. Yeah, man, if you want to get clean, you want to do it for yourself, not because of other people. or You know, you're going to want to do it for yourself, like Scott said. All right, Lee, good luck. Yeah. Jennifer. Yes. You're 21. Hi, Drew. Jennifer. Yeah, you probably remember me from the hospital. Jen which Jennifer? Um, oh. Oh, my, I remember her her voice from the last and seen us. Yeah. She was the crazy one that was, like, uh, mm -hmm. sneaking drugs in there and getting loaded, and you kept on putting her back on, uh, like, uh, back been, on I've early been, status. I've been in rehab 40 times. I just thought I have a long-term PC. Okay. And long term what? Therapeutic community. Oh, I see. Where I went after I detoxed and I'm manic depressive and I got in an episode and I tried to hurt myself. And they put me in the hospital and they strapped me down and they shot me up with Ativan. And ever since then it's like You're on heroin right now, are you? No, I'm not. You're not? No, I they shot me up with Ativan and that was my drug of choice. And um I didn't like the feeling of it, and I started to use a lot of it, and so then I got my hands on Ritalin, and have been um, having a problem with that, and my counselor, my good counselor wants to put me back in treatment, and I'm scared to go. Why? Um, I just, I'm tired of treatment. I'm just, I don't feel like it works. I get my life together, and then the manic depression kicks in, and... And then I'm back on, on drugs. Well. And um, so I've just, and I haven't, I've become anorexic, basically. I have the tendencies. I, You know I was really heavy, and I'm like a size 14 now, and I'm not eating much. And I went to a doctor and got a three-month script of speed. Okay. Uh, listen, Jennifer, all I hear now is desperation and confusion. I know you feel better when you get clean, when you're in a structured environment, when you're around people that care about you. And I know that you regain meaning, you regain a sense of yourself. Right. And it doesn't feel so bad, doesn't look so hopeless when you're in a different place. And I know the you're... manic depression kicked in, and I wanted to... I understand it's there now, and I understand that needs to be managed also. But you got to you got to get with it. you got to get back. You need yeah. a structured environment. You've got people that care about you. Yeah, my counselor wanted to come over to my apartment and well, throw away my pills, and I told him I was going to. And well, I'm not. I don't know that that's right necessarily. That's sort of a, a boundary issue. But certainly, you ought to get somewhere where you can be cared for properly. It says uh, on the screen she's pregnant by a drug counselor. Okay. Okay. That's good. Wasn't you? Was it true? Uh, not drug counselor. Well, sometimes if they can't pay. Yeah, um, Jennifer. Yeah. Are you pregnant? I I don't think I am right oh, now. But all right. I thought I was, and when you called in? Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> I went. I didn't. They weren't sure because I kept having positive tests, but then the ultrasound was inconclusive. Huh. Oh, baby. Hey, uh, well, yeah, my uh... The, guy, the guy said that he cared about me, and then he sent me an email saying that if I didn't give him certain sexual favors, that I couldn't be his woman anymore. All right, well, listen. Hey, Jennifer. Yeah. Uh, don't worry about relationships at this particular point in your life. I mean, you worry about getting better. Right. And, uh... And I've been trying to get off the Ativan, and I have... Well, withdrawal. yeah, yeah, listen. You you have tough withdrawal. You need to be somewhere when you do that. All right, so, Drew, is this a, a patient you've seen before or mm -hmm. something like that? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And, Scott, have you seen her uh, yeah, around I, the hall? I was in rehab with her before when Drew she, uh, treated us both. Oh, my God. And uh, you just remember her name or her voice? No, I remember her voice totally. I, I know exactly what she looks like. And uh, is uh, she was actually uh, um, having uh, people sneak drugs into her at the place that, uh, that uh, we were at, I remember. Drew, how do some people get 
you know, do drugs with a vengeance. Do you know what I mean? I mean, do you have to be the product of some kind of abuse? No. Or no, I did drugs with a vengeance. God was amongst the best. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow, yeah. that's, that's so delightful. <laughs> I mean, you, but it, I, mean it's, it's, I know people have drug problems, and there's people like OD, and there's, but there's some people that do it like a drive, like it's a, it's it's a, a it's like a salmon it's going up stream kind of drive. You well, know? after a while, you know, it's kind of like it... Um, you just have a feeling that it's coming to a really bad, um, bad end, and it's that almost become like a, a self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy. And you just want to, like, you want to like hit that wall as fast as you possibly can. So you just almost like you purposely accelerate the process to either end it all or get, or, or at least get to a point where you're going to have to force yourself to quit or or, or get help. Right. Like this girl, though, I know her. Drew knows her. I really would suggest um, that that. She goes somewhere, like Drew said, and, and get medically detoxed and then go to a long-term treatment place yeah. like either Impact House or Cry Help because well, well, uh, she's got a lot of issues to uh, do with Obviously, the, she's saying manic depressive depression, you know, kicks in. She's, she's obviously using the drugs to replace something that isn't there or, mm. or you know, she wants to be there. So what is the, what is the, what is the source of her manic depression? It's hard to tell until she gets clean well, for a while. Yeah, yeah, but she has a brain injury, yeah. and that's yeah. and she's got, and she has had to be on lots of medicines to stabilize that. And that's yeah. one of her problems is her her manic depressive is so awful that she mm -hmm. just decompensates really easily. Jim, yeah, you're 14. Hey, what's up? I was just I wanted to ask uh, STP a question. Sure, man. I was wondering uh, where you got Sarah Michelle Geller from. Uh, you know, I found her in a cereal box. <laughs> um, is that a milk carton? <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, we're all fans of the show Buffy the Vampire Slayer and uh, in the Cruel Intentions movie. I thought it was really, um, you know, kind of fun. And uh, you know what? When I was in jail, that was one of the three TV shows that I was able to lobby the guys, uh, you know, uh, around for votes and and watch uh, that, that Ally McBeal and the X Files um, and uh, for good reason two of those shows happen to have you know good looking girls Buffy the Vampire Slayer and uh, Ally McBeal actually Julian Anderson is good looking too oh, well, um, when you're when you're you know incarcerated you could probably uh, squeeze one off of one of the male attorneys in the Ally McBeal <laughs> but you know what she was. Uh, so you know we're fans of hers, and uh, when we asked her, she she would be interested, and she said she was a, you know that she would definitely do it, and she was a huge fan of the band, and uh, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun. Um, she was very sweet and uh, very professional. All right, Jim. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hey, uh, how does that work with the TV privileges when you're uh, in the clink? Um, what happens is, uh, in at seven o'clock at night is when free time begins. Mm -hmm. You have free time between seven and ten, and this is in the BRC program. That's the treatment right sort of uh, facility. Um, and uh, and you vote on the shows. There's a guy that's his job is the TV monitor. Everyone has a job there, you know. And uh, and there's the TV monitor, so it's like okay, vote time. Everyone goes in who wants to watch TV. You can't go in and vote if you're going to leave the room. I'm thinking about seeing in one flew over the cuckoo's. Right. right. Kind of like you know, that. The like Indian that. picks up the uh, drinking fountain. You guys make a break for it. <laughs> <laughs> we had a guy in that was like that, actually. Uh, his nickname was Tiny. He was a giant Mexican young man. Uh, Daniel, his name was. And uh, we, 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 we played basketball on the weekend. So he, the he really, exactly. And uh, we, we yeah, we did. And he he was not very coordinated. He was a very he was a huge man, about six foot six, two hundred and like ninety pounds. But when he would stand underneath the basket, he could get just about every rebound. And if you threw him the ball, he could just kind of like toss it in. It's just like uh, just like exactly. my mom and grandma were talking about. But he couldn't hit the free throw. Could and not. So they would intentionally foul him. Yeah. Send him to the line and uh, cash in. But now, how could she? So they, they, so there's one TV, right? One TV, and you vote every uh, after the end of every show. You vote again for the next show. And you, you have to register to vote, or <laughs> you just get to vote. It's uh, you know the uh, motor voter. Uh, and they, uh, so you you vote. Anyone who's interested in watching TV during that free time, and is it? It, now, what happens at uh, 10 o'clock? Is, is it lights it's out? It lights out, and uh, I have to say that there's this. Uh, 
It wasn't so bad when when um, Officer Escamilla worked. Officer Escamilla was about a, a five foot two, very pretty Mexican young woman, and uh, um, very sure of herself though, not at all intimidated in a dorm full of sixty guys. Uh, but she was quite nice to look at, and so everyone kind of looked forward to the nights when she worked. And she would say, lights out, and go around with a flashlight, make, check her, do her rounds, and right. uh, you'd see all the guys kind of like trying to get one last look before the lights went out, and then they would go about their personal business. Right. But uh, now, now, and what time were, uh, what time was wake up time? 5.30 in the morning. Wow. Yeah. It was like being in the uh, military. It was exactly, it, you've seen the movie Full Metal Jacket, right? Yes. Yeah. That's what the the barracks looked like. They it's over in East LA. It used to be an internment camp for uh Japanese uh you know well they put Japanese Americans in these internment camps during the war and that's what it was. They they were ar like army style barracks with the bunks on each side. Um oh. where, was it that corrugated tin with the rounded roof like Gomer Pyle lives in? Similar kind of thing. Kwanzaa. Awesome. Kwanzaa. I you know, I, I saw I, I I gotta get. I, there's so many questions I have about this, but I just gotta say I saw like a Gomer pile at four in the morning the other day, and here's basically it. I just turned it on. I don't know if I was uh, drunk or stoned. I don't know what kind of condition I was in, but I turned it on. There's Gomer standing at the MP gate, at the guard gate at the front, and here comes Sergeant Carter with his girlfriend Bunny coming in after a date, and it's like halt, Sergeant Carter, and it's like. Uh, yeah, Pyle. Uh, I was told by you not to let anyone pass this gate. And like, Pyle, get out of the way. Sorry, you can't do it. And I thought that was that that whole thing was a comedy premise back in the '60s, which is you told me not to let anybody in this gate. Now you're telling me to let you in, and I won't let you in because you told me. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and you know, there's that big speech where it was like. Pile. I don't care who gives you a story. I don't care if the if the Prince of Monaco comes through right. here. You do not let a soul through this gate. You got that pile? Yes, sir, Sergeant Carter. Fast forward to Sergeant Carter trying to come through the gate, not letting him in. <laughs> and, and he has to screw it up twice before he gets right, that bit. Right, and right. And that that did that was good for a half hour episode of comedy, yeah. right yep. there. Sergeant right. Carter right. trying a couple to get by, jokes, trying to get by the gate. But uh, I, I we're going to take ourselves a break. When we come back, I'm interested in uh, in sort of the uh, the schedule uh, here and the votes and uh, in the food. Food. That's a whole. We, uh, we need a whole segment. All right. Well, we do. We'll do a quick abridged uh, version of the food. Stone Temple Pilots are here. We'll take a little break. Let's just say we ate something called Dirk Diggler. <laughs> After this. <laughs> 